Hello everyone! Today we're going to talk about the Calvin Cycle. This is part two of the lectures on photosynthesis. Last time we talked about the light-dependent reactions, and today is all about the Calvin Cycle, or the light-independent reactions. Photosynthesis is an important process that allows life on Earth. There are a lot of different types of processes. For example, there are cyclical processes and linear processes. In order to start thinking about these processes, I have a few questions for you. First, what is a cyclical process? Compare it to a linear process. Give an example of both. Which one is more common? Please pause the video and answer these questions with your partner or on your own. What cyclical processes did you think of? I have a few examples. Cyclical processes are very common in nature because they allow the process to be more sustainable and efficient. For example, the moon cycle or the hydraulic cycle, the water cycle. If there wasn't a cycle, we would run out of water on Earth. Cyclical processes can also be used by industry. For example, you can extract raw materials, manufacture them to produce a product, then distribute them, people will buy them, and after they have used them, dispose them and then to be recycled, and some of those parts can be reused to make more products. I want to introduce you to a really large problem in the world, plastic water bottles. This is a beautiful picture that I took while I was in Haiti. Unfortunately, this picture is cut off, and the rest of the picture shows a huge pile of plastic bottles. What should happen to these plastic bottles? These plastic bottles should be recycled, right? But unfortunately, the process of water bottles is often linear, meaning that the manufacturers make the plastic bottles, then they are used by people and then thrown away, and not recycled back into the system. This is a problem. What should be done with these plastic water bottles? Be innovative and think of a solution. Maybe it means turning these plastic bottles into something other than plastic bottles for future use. A lot of times there's a lot of waste when processes are linear. That's why we need to think about how to make processes cyclical so that there's less waste, things are reused, and the process is more efficient. Let's talk about food waste. 40% of all food produced in the United States is wasted. This is a huge problem, but nature has a cyclical process solution where the food is composted and returned to the soil to help grow more food. We'll talk more about this in a later lecture. So think about it. Where should this wasted food go? What should be the process and what are the solutions for the current problem? When faced with a problem, always try to think of a solution. Cyclical processes are incredibly important. We're now going to dive into the cyclical process, which is photosynthesis. We already learned about the light reactions, where the plant uses the energy from the sun to charge batteries. These batteries are then used in the Calvin cycle, where the plant manufactures carbohydrates. We're now going to watch an excellent video made by Ted Ed. Please find this video link in the description underneath this video. Then come back to this video and we will summarize the video and review the process thoroughly. I hope you loved the video. Now please answer these four questions about the video. How did the video describe photosynthesis? What analogy did they use? Explain in your own words how the process happens. What were some new terms and definitions you learned. At least list four. What questions do you have about the process? After you're done with these questions, continue with the video. Step one was all about carbon fixation. Who did that? The duck in the video. Rubisco took one carbon atom and added it to the five carbon sugar called RUBP. In the video, they showed Rubisco welding it. But in actuality, it's a molecular process that's bringing the two parts together. 
step two was PGA formation. The sixth carbon molecule that Rubisco made in the previous step is unstable. So this six carbon sugar is then split into two molecules of PGA. Then using ATP and NADPH, PGA is turned into G3P, also called PGAL. This is another three carbon compound that's more stable. And then some of those G3Ps made in the Kelvin cycle are used to create glucose. Next, it's necessary to replenish the RUBPs. Some of the G3P molecules are recycled and reformed to create RUBP. This couldn't be possible without the ATP that, remember, comes from the light reactions. Each 5-carbon RUBP is ready to begin the cycle again, so Rubisco, or the duck in the video, needs to weld those again to carbon dioxide, and the cycle continues. It's really important that you remember that RUBP is continually recycled, and this is what makes the process cyclical. So let's review these steps. In step one, carbon fixation occurs. This is done by Rubisco. In step two, PGA is formed. In step three, the use of ATP and NADPH turn PGA into G3P, also called PGAL. In step four, glucose production happens. In step five, ATP helps replenish the RUBP so the cycle can continue. This graphic shows the same process that the video shows. Obviously, a little bit more overwhelming, but if you take the time, you'll see that the process is the exact same. Carbon dioxide enters, we have PGA, we have G3P, we then have sugar produced, and then ATP is used to replenish RUBP. This also shows the light reactions that we talked about in the last video. There's a problem in this factory sometimes, and it's called photorespiration. When things are going well, Rubisco takes carbon dioxide, adds it to RUBP, and the Calvin cycle continues in a healthy manner. However, if oxygen concentrations are too high in the leaf, Rubisco doesn't know the difference between carbon dioxide and oxygen. Rubisco adds oxygen to RUBP, which starts a process called photorespiration. This is a harmful process for the plant. Rubisco's awesome, but unfortunately, he can't differentiate the difference between carbon dioxide and oxygen. Photorespiration wastes energy and steals carbon. This is a huge challenge in the factory. You may ask yourself, where is this oxygen coming from and why is it a problem? Well, we already covered it's a problem because when added to RUBP, it causes a bad process in the plant. Where did this oxygen come from? It came from the light reactions where water was split in photolysis. This is a cross section of a plant leaf. This is the top of the leaf and this is the bottom. At the bottom of the leaf you'll see these holes called stomata. These are vents in the plant leaf that allow the release of oxygen and the intake of carbon dioxide. On a moderate day the stomata are open. This means that oxygen from the light reactions can exit and carbon dioxide need for the Kelvin cycle can enter. But when weather is very hot and dry, plants need to conserve as much water as they can, so they close their stomata. This is to reduce water lice by evaporation out of the stomata. That means that oxygen from the light reaction is building up inside the leaf, and this causes photorespiration. Let's go back to the factory analogy. Pretend that at the factory they're making cookies. A main ingredient in cookies is sugar. Salt is also an ingredient into cookies, but you need way more sugar than salt. Adding too much salt to cookies can completely ruin it, just like adding too much oxygen to the Kelvin cycle can cause a huge problem. So the problem that oxygen is causing can be thought of as adding too much salt to cookies instead of sugar. So pretend that you have a factory that's making cookies and you have someone coming in and adding a bunch of salt to your sugar. This would make your cookies taste horrible, right? 
and you can pretend that it's the cookie monster coming and adding a bunch of salt when you want to add sugar, adding a bunch of oxygen when you want to add carbon dioxide. Too much oxygen, just like too much salt in cookies. So thinking of this factory analogy, this cookie factory, what would a factory do if someone was putting salt in the sugar during the day and causing this issue for cookie production? So if someone's adding salt to your sugar, what are you going to do about it? It's causing your cookies to taste horrible and it's really bad for business. I want you to pause and think of a solution. These are two solutions you may have thought of yourself. One, get security to transport the ingredients. When the sugar is being transported, have it secure so that you can ensure no one's adding salt to it. Then, assemble the cookies, do the baking, inside a locked room so that no one can come mess up the ingredients. Solution 2. Since the salt issue is only happening during the day, the factory could only get the ingredients at night and have security for the ingredients during the day. In other words, they can have a special night shift that gathers the sugar and makes sure that there's no one adding salt to it. Plants use these two solutions to ensure that the oxygen is not a problem. We'll go through these two examples. The first one is called C4 photosynthesis. C4 plants are the first solution. Their solution is getting the ingredients secured to transport them to a locked room. So you can see the factory or the inside of the leaf is arranged differently. You'll see in a C3 plant that the cells are more spread out and a little bit less organized. Whereas in the C4, you'll see this circular fashion. These are mesophyll cells and these are bundle sheath cells. So the bundle sheath cells is the secure room and C4 plants use malate to transport carbon dioxide from the mesophyll cells into the bundle sheath cells where the Calvin cycle occurs. So malate is the security guard to make sure that no salt is added to that special sugar. In review, C4 plants during the day their stomata are open and carbon dioxide is fixed into a four carbon acid in the mesophyll cells. This 4-carbon acid, which is malate, is security for the ingredients. Then that 4-carbon acid travels to the bundle sheath cells, these locked room, and release carbon dioxide where the Calvin cycle happens. At night, the stomata close. Some examples of C4 plants are grasses, corn, and sorghum. Unlike C4 plants, they don't have the locked room for Calvin cycle to occur in. The Calvin cycle in C3 plants occurs in the mesophyll cells, unlike C4 plants where the Calvin cycle happens in the bundle sheath cells. Some examples of C3 plants are beans, tomatoes, and apple trees. The next solution that we talked about, which is the night shift, these plants are called cam plants. At night, the stomata are open so carbon dioxide can enter the leaf. That carbon dioxide is fixed into a four carbon molecule called malate. That's the security guard holding on, escorting the carbon dioxide, so escorting the sugar and making sure no one is adding salt to it. That carbon dioxide, which is held by the malate, then is able to be used in the Calvin cycle during the day when the plant has the charged batteries, ATP and NADPH, to be used in the Calvin cycle. Cam plants are extremely drought tolerant. They don't open their stomata at all during the day. That means they can conserve water like crazy. They have a night shift when they open their stomata to gather carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is fixed into the four carbon acid, malate, and stored in the vacuole of the mesophyll cells until the next day. Those ingredients, which is the carbon dioxide, is secured in the mesophyll vacuole. Please note, that the Calvin cycle happens within the mesophyll cells in cam plants, not the bundle sheath cells like C4 plants. During the day, the stomata are closed to conserve water and the 4-carbon acid breaks down to release carbon dioxide inside the leaf for the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle to occur. 
Many desert plants are cam plants. Also, succulents are cam plants and cacti are cam plants. Here's a summary of the three types of photosynthesis, C3, C4, and CAM. Let's review. In C3, carbon dioxide enters the mesophyll cells and enters the Calvin cycle, which we covered in this video. In C4 plants, there's an additional step. Carbon dioxide comes in and is then fixed or secured into malate. This malate is then transported, like transporting sugar, so salt isn't added, into the bundle sheath cells where less oxygen can get in. Because there's less oxygen here, the Calvin cycle can happen without being interrupted by too much oxygen, which causes photorespiration. The Calvin cycle continues as usual. CAM plants at night open their stomata and take in carbon dioxide that's fixed into the four carbon molecule called malate and then is stored in the vacuole of the mesophyll cells during the day that is released and used in the Calvin cycle. So CAM plants have a night shift, C4 plants have this special locked room, both of these have a special transporter to make sure no salt is getting into their sugar called malate, the C4 fixation system, and C3 plants have carbon dioxide directly entering the Calvin cycle. There's no fixation process that happens first. In summary, today we covered the Calvin cycle. We covered the processes of the Calvin cycle. We talked about how carbon dioxide comes into the Calvin cycle and eventually creates sugar. We covered that there's some problems that happen because oxygen comes in and Rubisco doesn't know the difference, and that can cause photorespiration. But there's two solutions, which is C4 and CAM photosynthesis. We also realized what this ATP and NADPH were so important for. They make, they power the light independent reactions. They power the Calvin cycle. They are then used up or uncharged and then need to be recharged by the light reactions or the light dependent reactions. So you can see that there's a cyclical process here in the Calvin cycle and a cyclical process between the Calvin cycle and the light reactions over here. So nature is full of cyclical process including photosynthesis. I hope this lecture was helpful. Please feel free to email me or comment with questions. Have a great day.